I'm Captain Logan. And we're back for another installment of Harry Potter Discussions. Today we're going to talk about Harry Potter and... The Goblet of Fire. Are you just going to talk like that the whole video? No, probably not. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so today uh, we're, talking about, we're talking about Harry Potter 4. And uh, this one was directed by who, Jeff? Mike Newell. So another uh, director, all by his lonesome. Uh, another one shot. Doing the doing doing one movie, and uh, so so more of, a, of of yet another different directing style. Although in some ways, I feel like his directing style is a little closer to Columbus's actually. I think so. It it seems to integrate more with the earlier films and with the later films than did the Fonz. Yeah, which is maybe why three stands out so much for me. Could be. Having said that, this one even more than three for me has bits that are that are gone that I wish had been there. Yes. And I know that I'm not um, that I'm not a big book fan. This is one that I did read, but even yeah, but it's been a long time. But, but but even so, I get the feeling, and it's hard to know because I did read it. But I get the feeling that even if I hadn't, I would feel like there were bits that were gone. You know. Yeah. And the difference with with this and three is that for three it was like they replaced them with. With, with some stuff that I just didn't really care about. Four, it was more that, like, exciting scenes were gone, which was really sort of strange yeah. because you would... Because, like you were saying, yeah, with three, there, there's, the, there's, this, there's this notion that, you know, you get rid of the boring stuff so you can have the really exciting stuff. Where was the Quidditch match? Where, where was the, the big championship Quidditch match? Yeah, that is an omission that, that kind of rankled. I know I walked into the theater looking very much forward to seeing the Quidditch World Cup. and At uh, least parts of it. Blew that completely out. Which is a pity, because it introduces... It really introduces Crumb uh, in a much better way than they actually do in the film. It introduces... <coughs> in the Quidditch Cup scene in the book, we get, you uh, meet the Vila, the mascots of the Hungarian team, which are these magical creatures that at first look like impossibly beautiful women until they get mad and then turn into horribly evil harpy things, which uh, in the book were intimated that Fleur de la Cour, one of the champions, is actually has some Vila blood in her. Oh, interesting. Which is why she's able to uh, reduce the guys, and especially Ron, to uh, gibbering idiocy so much more drastically and effectively than normal pretty girls can. That's a good point because they, they they played that up when they walked in. Yeah. And then when you get to the part where they're all trying to get uh, where, where, the, where the guys are all trying to get girls for the dance you, you got you got more of the feeling with a lot of the guys that they just didn't even want to have to, <laughs> didn't to want do have to that. Deal with it. And it wasn't even so much that they just that, that they were falling over themselves because of these girls. It was because when they walk in to the uh, to the hall, you get the sense that they're all making them yeah. all do that, not just the one. They're all magic, <laughs> and then after that, they're all mm, yeah, whatever. That is, that was weird to me. They're also since there are no Quidditch games at school during the during the fourth year, the lack of the cup at the f at the beginning means it's an entirely Quidditch free movie, which. Oh. Well, it's not that, and again, I'm not the biggest Harry Potter fan in the world. I'm not really sitting there going, oh, God, I've got to have a Harry Potter. I, I've got to have a Quidditch match in my Harry Potter movie. It's much more, I, what irritates me is just from, from, a, from an editing perspective, I don't understand how you're putting this movie together and you're cutting directly from let the games begin to now the games are over yeah. and not expecting your audience to call foul on that. It honestly yeah. doesn't even matter what it is. When you get so much build-up, no matter what it is, you get this yes. giant, giant yes, build-up to something, and then, and then oh, you don't get to we're going to skip it because it's not important. And I'm like, well, it was important. We didn't want to spend the money on filming it. It was important to everybody else in the room, yeah. and we're supposed to... Um, and we're supposed to kind of be there with them. Uh, yeah. yeah that, the only reason I can think of not to have put that there is just plain, oh, that would have been expensive and complicated to make, and we don't want to. I mean, you, yes, you want to keep the movie under 16 hours long, <laughs> but... That is not the kind of stuff you need to worry about the extra length with. I'm not expect I'm not expecting the pod race from episode one. It, my my deal is we had one we we had one in, in one we have one in two. Yeah. Both of them provided some story points, so 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 naturally that's that's why they were there, and because 
Harry Potter fans are really going to cry foul if you have no Quidditch at all. Anyway, yeah. really you got to you got to you got to show it. and You got to have the rules and all that. But like, but with this, it's like I don't know. I'm just saying. It, I don't mean to belabor it, but there's a World Cup and we yeah. don't see any of it. At least, at least intercut a couple to a couple scenes yeah. of it. You know, I, whatever. But we also at during the game meet some other fairly major characters. Granted, most of them are written out of the movie altogether. Oh, okay. But uh, and. Or a that lot of the people that the show up later? Uh, some of them are people that show up later. Some of them are people that are just expunged from the continuity. Um, such as uh, Crouch's elf, Linky. Oh, okay. The second house elf we meet, and the, in the impetus for Hermione to go on her elf rights quest, which is also written clean out of the movie. Right. Okay. That's okay with me, but... Didn't enjoy that part anyway, but... <laughs> um... Uh, Nice exchange between uh, Ron, between Harry, Ron Hermione, and Malfoy and his goons after the match. Um, Crouch, we don't exactly meet his son there because he's invisible, but we get to know Crouch through that scene. They're really, I don't know, that seems like the least among the less superfluous things that they cut out. And I'm not <laughs> impressed by their reason for cutting it. Um, let, me, let me ask you this question, because once again, you've obviously read the book more recently than I have. Did they, um, in, in the book, I keep saying they, <laughs> the, the author, um, was, was, the, was there as much of a build-up to the dance in the book? Was yes. that as big of a deal as it was in the film? Um, yeah... Okay. Because... Because uh, either way, I didn't need it. It, 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 it. Well, I understand why it's there, and I get that we've got teenagers on the, on, on the, on the cusp of where they are, and that, and that th this would be the movie in the years where they're, where they're growing up that they would start getting interested in, in, in dating, and it makes sense that that's yeah. where the dance would fall. Let's pause Harry's fight against evil for a while and talk about teenage love for 20 minutes. Well, that was... But yeah, that was my problem with it, is that that's yeah. how it came off. So I get that it would be present... I also feel like it lopsides the movie a bit, at least, at least, at least for my money. Um, yeah, it. Uh, it might be somewhat of a personal taste thing, but I got to tell you, I feel like maybe something more interesting with the maze could have been done had we not spent so much time on that. And it's not just the length of the dance itself; it's that there are entire scenes that you think are maybe going to be about something else, and really are simply just people looking for dates for the dance, yeah. like. And. And that is. In the book, the dance is much better integrated with the the, the arcing story. Maybe that's my problem: is integration. In the movie. Is that the, the movie really seems to pause, like you said? It just yeah. kind of stops and says, "And now we're going to deal with this part." And it's almost as if it's almost like if this was broken up into TV episodes, like this is the comedy episode. You know yeah. what I mean? This is the trouble with tribbles of the, this is the Harry beach Potter episode. universe. Yeah. So nothing against yeah. tribbles. I'm just saying it's like this is the this is the this is the this is the comedy bit of our movie, yeah. you know? And um, that that really sh that really could have been. And again, it's got some great stuff's done with it. Um, the, the the scene where Snape's going around smacking people in the head because they won't yeah. stop talking about about the stupid dance. It's that hilarious. And I you said for it, Snape there. I wanted to smack them myself. And you said it wasn't in the book. And that's a good yeah. and that's a good addition. I that, mean, that's a place where they added something and I'm Most totally of that cool conversation was in the book. But it was not conducted in an atmosphere where there would be Snape hovering around behind them, smacking people for talking. But that was clever, and I liked it. That was a lot of fun, and the rolling up his sleeves to, for the final smack, priceless. Um, teen drama. I felt like the I felt like the conflict between Ron and Hermione later on over dating Crumb and and that felt okay to me but the fight between Harry and Ron in the first quarter of the film did not come off to me very plausibly. No, me neither. It was a little forced, and I, and I know, and I think that was, you know, in the book, but I, I just, yeah, it, that, it, it did seem forced in there a bit. The conflict was in the book. The playing of it in the movie felt 
felt a lot less human and a lot more let's have some teen angst between the boys. Do you mean like the way because that he that's tried what to girls like? You mean like the way that he tried to use Hermione to go between them and that sort of thing? Um to some extent that, but to more extent just the way Ron and Harry have these bizarre fight confrontations with each other. You know, between between the first one when he the name comes out of the cup and we establish that Ron doesn't believe him and is irrationally silly. And irrationally silly and crappy is uh, is a year in most teen boys' lives. I mean, this does happen. It's real. Harry's, Harry's year will be in book five. Ron's is in book four. Um, that's when the moon's full. But, you know, later on, the way they go into each other, the way Ron and Harry will bump into each other and and have these really incomprehensible japs at each other that just make no sense and felt to me like we're putting drama into the story and when I hate when they do that. plenty of real drama people there do that. already, I think. I don't know. Um, yeah. And this is one of those where, where I mean, Goblet of Fire was was my favorite idea of the series. Um, I really liked the Triwizard Tournament. That was a really cool idea. And I think that they did some great stuff with it in the movie. Um, I just wished it had been a little bit longer. And also, um, at the time, that, that book was almost infamous for being so freaking long. because It was by far it was, longer than any of the books previously. Yeah, I mean, it was almost double the size of the first book. And um, maybe it even was double the size of the first, first book. I mean, it's like 600 pages or more. And... Um, and so I remember when it came out, thinking, "How are they going to do this right?" You know, I, I remember yeah. at that time, at that time, even thinking this would be better if it was two movies. Of course, right. of course, little to my knowledge, later on they were they were going to actually do one like that. And I remember thinking, "Oh crap! When they make this movie, they're going <laughs> to cut out all the interesting stuff." Yeah, and that's not wholly true. They did not cut out all the interesting stuff. No. It's just it's just that um, what was cool in in that to me was was seeing the challenges and. Um, I, I thought that the first two were handled pretty well, and the third one left me a little cold. Yeah. The first challenge, interestingly, was pretty heavily revised. Oh, was it? What was different about it? Um, in, the, in the book, the, uh, each of the champions' dragon is a nesting mother, and it guards a whole pile of eggs, one of which is a golden one. Oh, yeah, that's right. And the champions are somehow to get the golden one from under a nesting mother. There's no chain breaking. There's no tour of the Hogwarts grounds. There's no knocking shingles off the castle. It's a matter of getting the egg without getting blasted and also without doing any harm to the dragons or the eggs because in the continuity the dragons are an endangered species You're not supposed to hurt them and they don't really play that up at all in the films and <clears throat> so you think it was kind of an action movie thing they, it was like we've, yeah. we've got to really but the thing is it's not like if they'd done it the same way and I still liked it in the movie but it just seems like couldn't they have still done it the same way and it be as as thrilling yeah. I think I don't know I don't I don't think that they had to make the change that they made in Harry's battle with his dragon. Because it's not like Harry actually yeah. hurt the dragon. Yeah. So I mean, they could still have had the whole you're not supposed to hurt it thing in there. It's not like he was like throwing fireballs with his wand or anything. And and in the book Harry avoid, Harry defeats the dragon by getting a broom which none of the others think of. And then just and then kind of luring it to take a few steps away far enough so that he can then do his famous dive and grab the egg quick before the dragon can react. Which and they really they really stretched it out so that they could, you know, fly all over I think the that universe. The, yeah, I I think the the first challenge, as Rowling wrote it, would have done them just fine. Yeah. I think so. And too. they wouldn't have had and that would have bought them a little bit of extra time, so they wouldn't have had to cut or shrimp on so many other things that really that I really felt the lack of in watching the movie, such as the 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 deep information we get when Harry finds the Pensieve and sees not just the trial of Karkaroff, but also the trial of the Lestranges, which is how Harry finds out 
that they are responsible for torturing Neville's parents into insanity, um, or some of the other things that he sees in there. Which is mentioned, but so briefly you don't even really yeah. know. It. Like, like I think that they tried to combine them, kind of, because because uh, the Longbottoms are mentioned they in are that mentioned trial. In Karkaroff's trial. Uh, but I didn't get the sense necessarily from that that they were that they were insane. Yeah. I, I wasn't really sure what exactly that happened there. It was just something about yeah, the long... They were attacked somehow. I think they were just listening, here's some things that these bad people... Here's some people that these bad people heard, and the long bottoms were in that list. And in the fifth book, we'll get to meet the long Neville's parents and find out exactly what was done to them in more detail. I don't recall whether that scene made it into the movie, in which case we'll never... If it doesn't, then we'll never know. Yeah. Except unless we read, which is yeah, which one of the you know, book things. Reading's good. The <laughs> the uh, also written out was Bertha Jorkins, who uh, a ministry employee, who is how Voldemort finds out about the World Cup, and oh, because that's whole all plan gone. And why Voldemort comes back from Albania, where he was has been lurking. And how he find, Voldemort also finds out about that uh, Barty Crouch's son is in fact alive instead of having died in Azkaban, at, as had been thought. Okay, yeah. So, so once again, we've got a movie that that feels a little bit supplementary. That, or, or I mean, I'm sorry, that, that feels almost like you need supplementary reading. Um, and now, I, again, I still like it better than three, just as a movie. Yeah. But, but um, and, and, I did too. And, and I and I think that that because um, because again, I feel like I, I feel like we're we're kind of hammering it again, um, like we did a little bit with three. But the thing the thing about this one is, um, again, you get to the end, and I think that the or close to the end, and again, I think the climax is really well handled. Um, I think that. Um, Again, not being able to compare it much to the book because I don't remember, but but I mean, like, like I didn't feel like they rushed through the graveyard scene. No, that I think was treated very well. Um, the maze. But yeah, how they got there. You're right. That needed to be there. How did like 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 oh the the cup is a port key. How did he know about the? How did he? Yeah. Where, who put it there? None of that's mentioned. I don't think. Yeah, this all gets hand waved. Um, why the maze itself? seems to have been thinned out of a lot of the obstacles that were promised. And, yeah, I don't know. I felt like they skimped on the maze to make more time for the dragon sequence. Yeah, that's exactly and, the way I felt about it when I saw it in the theater. And I don't understand why you would dilute the third and climactic task to make a bigger deal out of the first one. The only thing I can think of is because it's the first time we've had a full-grown dragon in the series, and because it's sword and oh, sorcery, okay. we're supposed to make a big deal out of dragons. Um, I well, would, dragons are awesome. I, mean, yeah, I would not be surprised, and I mean, maybe I'm making stuff up, I would not be surprised if, they, if, if really the logic behind that was Lord of the Rings is big, and we have to make a big deal out of a dragon. That, I mean, that's... That could be. You know, keep in mind the, the, when this was released. Some more things have happened. Yeah, where it's just like, we've got a dragon too, let's make a big deal out of it. I, I don't know. But, uh, but, but I don't know. In, in my mind, when you've got a big giant maze, that's where the cool stuff happens. Yeah. Especially when, when again, it's your it's your climactic. Yeah, and uh, and it again the change the shift in emphasis from um, a book version where the maze the point of the maze is to number one find your way to the center, but number two overcome monsters, traps, puzzles, the riddle of the Sphinx, and some other, and you know, other sorts of obstacles to test your knowledge and magical ability in all sorts of ways, to just, we'll put you in here, we'll say something really spooky before you walk in as to threaten that you will lose your mind in there, and then, yeah, <laughs> the, and the hedges move, and sometimes throw roots out to trip, to tangle you. I Once again, it's a shift totally from... I anticlimactic when I first saw it. it. They've made a shift in focus in the adaptation they've made from concrete, actual action to teen drama about Harry and Cedric as rivals and then joining up and then Crumb is, turns into a monster and uh, Fleur de la Cour is swept out of the way immediately and never dealt with. Yeah, um, that's right. Well, I feel bad for about 
bad for Fleur in this movie, just even more than in the book, because after the uh, after that first task, she turns into the complete butt monkey. It was, she gets blown out of the second task. Yeah, she's That's totally, Rowling's she's fault. She's totally shafted. She uh, is blown out of the third task right away, and uh, I don't know. It's almost like Rowling hates her because she's pretty. <laughs> well, that's weird when you got a female writer because, I mean, you know, you've got four people in a, in a, in a, in a challenge that's supposed to only have three, and three of them are guys, and yeah. you're going to keep shafting your yeah. chick? Really? We'll make you the fourth wheel. I wonder if that All was... Right. Un I wonder if that's intentional. I really do. Might be. Yeah, who knows? Could be. Could be a point you wanted to make. It that's could... totally an author thing. Um, while we're on the uh, the challenges, I do I do want to just because I think it's funny. If I you're just, watching this, by the way, J.K. Rowling, uh -huh. we still love you. I I want to I just want to mention because I think it's funny that don't be angry. There's there's uh, that two out of the three uh, tasks make absolutely no sense to have an audience watching them. Yeah, and yet there's an audience there. And, and it's it's so hilarious because I mean the the uh, I mean the third one even more so than the second yeah. one but okay the first one we got a we got a dragon garden and egg in an arena with people sitting right yes I would pay yeah. money to see that sure yeah. and nobody you knows watch the battle. and it's on a chain so nobody really expects that it's going to get off the chain and fly off and fly around the universe and you won't be able to see it so so at least at least in the first place yeah. you know you 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 expect that you're going to get to see stuff the second one. Is almost entirely yeah. it's in, all in underwater. Fact, entirely underwater. So, and the third one is a hedge maze that closes behind it, so and that people can get out mist. and no one can see it, and it's shrouded in mist. So is the audience? What are the uh, what is the audience doing during all that time? And we have magic. Can we not make like a big magic pool or a big misty yeah. thing in the sky with like some like magic cameras so people can see it? I don't understand. I think it's hilarious. Well, and maybe they do, but it, it just never shows up in the movie. I really just picture them sitting around being really bored and waiting for things to happen. And, yeah, but anyway, I think it's funny. X in the center. Um, Darn it! I think, uh, regardless of the fact that, of course, at the end it turns out that it's not really him. Uh, Moody was super well cast and oh, is yeah. Brendan Gleeson. Hilarious, a marvelous job. And this is maybe just a story thing, and this isn't even against the movie. This is just a, a story thing. I would probably say this for the for, for the for the original story too. Um, I don't really like it when I when I start really enjoying a character that I just met and then I get to the end and I find out that it was never him in the oh, first place. Yeah. That's a problem for me because, and, and I mean, I mean, fine, when we do finally meet Moody after that, he's probably characterized exactly the same way so I sort of feel like I met him because um, because the bad guy was doing yeah. a good job of playing him but when I'm like like laughing I think with a character, like like when he um, when he turns yeah. Malfoy into into a um, into a rodent or whatever um, or a ferret and, and, and that sort of thing and then it turns out that none of that was actually him I feel a little bit yeah. cheated as, as a reader or, or as a viewer, what's real? One of the things about this that was interesting to me, and it comes through some in the film, more in the book, but that the false Moody turns out to be a really good teacher. Yeah, and in some ways, a really good guy. And yes, he's actually the Barty Crouch tongue flicking junior in disguised by Polyjuice Potion. But along the way, as he deals with, you know, he encourages Neville in a very sensitive way after, you know, frightening the Dickens out of him in class. Um, his talks with Harry, his, his appearances with other students in general, I always got this sense that pretending to be moody was drawing something out of Barty Crouch Jr., that was better than who he had been all these years as uh, as a Voldemort follower and then living in hiding. Yeah, that'd be great. The problem that I see with but that, but of course, then he's you know is that then well, he's up in the this, end. yeah, the, but and then and then he goes back to just being the same sniveling guy yeah. with the with the tongue flicking out, and I'm not sure that I trusted. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not sure that I trust that we saw any real character development for that guy. I, it feels much more retro, like yeah. a retrospect thing. I, I'm not saying she didn't plan it out, but just just watching it, it, it feels it feels a lot a lot more like um, if she had written the real Moody, those were the things she yeah. would have done with him. And because she wanted this big plot twist, that's that's what it yeah. actually turned out to be. I don't like that sort of thing. That that that, yeah, that bugs think. me because I don't think we really saw any character. Although again, anything with that guy. It should be stated that him coming back as tongue flicking and evil and nasty is totally a movie thing. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the book, he uh, is forced to testify under basically hypnosis, a veritaserum, and uh, doesn't get a chance to do to say much else before uh, Fudge has the Dementors in to dis to destroy his soul. Um, which itself is a plot point with consequences for book five that we didn't get to see. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, I'm probably being too hard on that then. I, it's, it's one of those things where I, I really liked that character, yeah. and then I found out that it wasn't really him, so I didn't get to know him. Um, I wish we how got much, to see more of Moody. How much is done with Moody in the books after we finally figure out who the real Moody is? Because I know the real get, character shows yeah. up again in the movies, we but I don't know... We get bits of him in five. Okay. Um, and... I just wish he had gotten to come back and be a teacher you get again. Bits of, yeah. And 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 why doesn't he? That's my question. Is because with the, with the others that 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 t that take that post, there's always a reason that they have to be dismissed or that they leave. And with him, it's like he didn't even get to do the job in the first place. Why why doesn't he stay and do the job? Um, book theoretically, Dumbledore had persuaded him to come out of retirement. He's retired. Okay. For just one year. This one year because of the Triwizard Tournament. Dumbledore is worried that something weird is going to go down. So he doesn't need meanwhile, a job, so... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the real Moody, meanwhile, has just spent the last year in a box. Yeah, that's that's totally true. And would he be willing to come back and teach again? No, thanks. Uh, I wish we had gotten to see David Tennant more, uh, because yeah. David Tennant is, Tennant is an actor I like. I don't think he was wasted in the role. I think that was the right pick for it, but he didn't get to do very yeah. much. So, yeah, kind of. We don't like, get to see much of that character. Kind of like Pettigrew. He's he's one of those characters that you know he's disguised the whole movie. So by the time yeah. you finally see him, he doesn't get to act. Once again, you know Timothy Spall, David Tennant. Two really strong character actors that we're going to use for 30 seconds. <laughs> That's the way the ball crumbles. But boy, do I like the guy who plays Voldemort, and I'm glad he finally gets screen time. Yeah. Because that stuff's awesome. Um, Michael Jackson could take some advice from him about nose jobs. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> the. It's interesting we actually get to see a little bit of the weird mutant baby Voldemort. Yeah, that thing. was weird. Um, and appropriately extremely creepy. Voldemort's scene when he comes back reminds me of something I've been noticing in these in general. Some of the characters hold their wands in just the most bizarre ways. I mean, pick up... do this experiment. Pick up a pencil sometime and pretend it's a magic wand and cast a spell and look at your hand and then look at the way these... they have these strange grips that they use in these movies. Um, do you especially the evil people. Do you wonder sometimes if the grip has something to do with the spell? I it's suppose... Like how you hold it could have something to do with, the, with a particular cast? I suppose that would be the intention. That's all I can figure. Otherwise, I don't see why anyone would think I'm using a magic wand to focus magical energy to cast a spell and hold it like uh, a gay violinist. Uh, sorry if any of you are gay violinists. I don't mean to offend. But I don't understand casting spells like that. Or like that with the wand coming out that direction. I don't ex Yeah, in Voldemort they does look the weirdest strange. ones. Yeah. Then again, Voldemort is like supposed, supposedly immensely more powerful than anyone has ever been, and knows magic things that no one else knows, has traveled the world in search of darkness and secrets, so maybe there is something too. One thing's holding the wand 
bizarrely. One of the things I love about what's done with Voldemort is that they, they uh, I think they do a really good job of making him seem as powerful as, as he's supposed to be. Like, sometimes you get these evil characters where they're just talked about as being really scary, and the only way they ever really show you that they're scary is that they, like, shoot a henchman. But with, yeah. but with Voldemort, um, you, you get you get a sense of his power, not just, not just in his presence and his stature, but also in the fact that he seems to do things that nobody else is able to do, and that's, yeah. that's done very deliberately, where, like, something that you would expect where anybody else would have to do an incantation, he just yeah. points a wand and it happens. And uh, so, and this is best illustrated when he uh, grows Wom Tong's uh, uh, hand back. Yeah. Uh, because, um, because like that seems like a really powerful spell. Yeah, that you could do that. You think keep, that'd be complex and complicated? Keep in mind, Voldemort just. Yeah, there you go. Keep in mind, uh, a couple movies ago where uh, Harry Potter's uh, arm went limp and it took days yeah. for them to grow to, to grow a bone back. This guy's doing it like this. It's the same thing, yeah. and he's in fact, it's got to be harder because he's growing back. He's like growing back bones yeah. hurts. He's growing back an entire Joints and muscles freaking and everything. hand, and I think an arm, and um, and, he, and he just flicks it. But the other thing that was really cool about that too is that at first. It seems like he's not even going to, because he says, because yeah. he says, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, Wormtail, you put out your hand, right? And then he's, and, and then he put out your arm. Put out your no, arm. No, not that arm. Yeah, and uh, so, so that that's a great illustration of his power and his and his yeah. presence all at the same time. And his cruelty. Um, Which, I just think he's characterized. Yeah. Great. I mean, I mean, there, there's there's such a menace with that character yeah. for for the you know for the five minutes you get to see him on screen, uh, even and I mean even more so than the first time you know we saw him in that first movie. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a very effective character. Why? 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 In a movie with so many very good visual effects. You know, with dragons, that look awesome. And uh, with, you know, still with the moving pictures, that's been in several of the movies now, but they're still looking good. With the stained glass window mermaid who moves, not just the paintings move, the stained glass windows move, that's awesome. That was um, awesome. With the mer people who look as good and interesting as they do. Not how I would have expect, expected to see a mer person, but then again, having seen them, well, okay, yeah, I'll buy that. With so many really good looking visual effects, when those four hostages are tied up underwater, do they look like plastic blow up dolls? I don't think they look that bad. I mean, they, they, they look like, you know, Models, maybe of, a wax model. Of the, yeah, kind. Of, of, the, of, of the people that they are. I mean, charitably just, speaking, I, I don't know that they could have really used actors for that. No, they could. Well, no, they probably couldn't. But so, so I'm just saying, I don't know how else you would have done it, and I don't see how they could have made them look any more real than they than, than they than they did. Um, I think that the problem is not in the actual props as it is in the way they're shot, because I think that, that we get too many close-ups on their faces. Um, if they had just been shot farther off in a different lighting, it wouldn't have been a problem. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how to do movie special effects, but it, it really jumped out to me how bad they looked compared to so much other stuff in that movie that looks so very good. I don't know why. Just for the record, and I don't know why I noticed, but uh, but yeah. Wow. That's yeah, you know, you know, not until you said it, and then I was like, well, yeah, you know, wow. of, co of course they're they're you know you know they're models, but I mean you know. And then after you said that, I was like, yeah, okay, I could tell they're fake, but th I don't that's know why because the they shot them too close. Department and the director who was satisfied with all of those other very good looking scenes did not take one look at that underwater scene and say, guys, this looks like crap. Do something else. I don't think it looks that bad. That's just me. Yeah. It, it's the difference from everything else. I mean, I grew up on Doctor Who. I do not live my life expecting good visual effects. It's when there's a lot of really good visual effects, and then one that is so markedly not as good as but, the rest of them. But notably, that gets my attention. But notably, there's a huge difference between visual effects and practical effects. That's not a visual effect. It's not. It's not animated. It's a practical effect. They uh. they used models. It's a, It's different. That's all I'm saying. 
So that, but that's why you noticed it because I hadn't meant to use the word visual effect in that. Oh, okay, okay. I'm just saying the reason you noticed it was because what they showed you was a real physical thing, as opposed to, I mean, yeah, your, as your, to your computer mind, generated. As a, as a viewer who's seen a lot of computer generated things now, your 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 mind um, has been trained to accept visual effects that don't look 100% real as looking more real in the context of what you're looking at because you're used to animated things integrated in, 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 into real things now and and um, and uh, that and that's and, and that's good when it, when, it, when it works well you, you, you have to try to make it look as real as you can integrated with the things so the problem is that you just saw a lot of animated stuff that looks pretty good with the visual stuff as animated things and then you saw something that your brain said this is real and it didn't look real enough to you. That's why you noticed it. Hmm. It must be admitted that the floating hostages unconsciously seen would have looked magically real in a movie full of uh, Daleks and tinfoil. Well, sure. But it wasn't in a movie full of Daleks and tinfoil, despite having David Tennant in it. So there we have it. <laughs> um, what else do we want to talk about? Um... We we talked a lot about yeah. the uh, about the the uh, the challenges and stuff. We need to talk about Angry Dumbledore. Angry Dumbledore makes me angry. <laughs> um, here is a character that the author is careful to describe again and again in each book as serene, as unfazed by anything. I mean anything. He has so many scenes where. The remarkable, the attention-getting, the striking thing about Dumbledore is how he is not freaking out and panicking in situations where anybody else in the universe would be freaking out and panicking. And in this movie, all of a sudden, we have him freaking out and panicking when Harry's name comes out of the cop, grabbing Harry by the shoulders and shaking him to interrogate him, to ask him if he has put his own name in. That does not happen in the book, by the way. Uh, in fact, in the books, in the fifth volume, when we see another person, the evil Umbridge, grabbing a, a student and shaking her by the shoulders, Dumbledore intervenes and actually kind of casts a spell to make her let go in pain and says, you must not manhandle my students. Dumbledore grabbing Harry by the shoulders and shaking him Dumbledore in the pensive scene, looking flustered and frustrated and confused. Understandable that a person in that in that situation would be flustered and confused and frustrated. However, Dumbledore's defining characteristic is that he isn't. And he is not confused. He's not actually flustered because he knows so much more than he says. But more importantly, because he just does not react in that way. And not generally characterized as a huge uh, hypocrite, right? Yeah. A hippogriff. Yeah, oh. hypocrisy is not <laughs> a part of his character. And that's the, uh, that is, the angry Dumbledore we get in so many scenes in this movie was one thing that really, it, uh, it annoyed me a lot about the script adaptation, because I'm, I'm sure that's the level at which that's happening. I don't think that is Michael Gamblin's idea. I don't, I don't think it is either. It doesn't seem like that. But uh, it Just made me think... Just he, because he didn't, he didn't give us that in 3, and there were places in 3 where he could have acted more frustrated than what yeah. we were He had such a command of what was going on in that movie. And, yeah. and remember, when we reviewed it, we, 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 even, we even said, he seems to know time yeah, travel is happening when time travel, when, when, when yeah. it hasn't even happened yet. So um, you get to this, and he seems sideswiped by everything. And it, so, once again, I like to put things in perspective. The, the problem is not just, well, he wasn't like that in the books. It's that it's inconsistent within the film yeah. series. Um, when, we, when, we, when we get flashbacks later to stuff that he's been through. This is a guy who's seen some stuff. Well, yeah. You know, um, th this is a guy who knew Voldemort, of course, when when Voldemort was at was at his peak before he went away. Yeah. And so, I mean, like, like this was a guy who knew Voldemort be, when he was ten. Yeah, he can't be phased by by stuff the way the way he is yeah. here. Where it's like where it's like he's making that big of a deal out of the fact that Harry Potter, how Harry Potter's name got thrown in a cup. I mean, clearly. <coughs> 
the Dumbledore yeah. that, that, that I that I thought I knew before this, I, I figured would just kind of be a uh, detective about it and go, okay, who has the means to put his name in there? Yeah. Uh, what are their motivations? Let's get to the bottom of this. And I really don't think the the, the first place he would jump to is um, is uh, Harry Potter. You know, yeah. did this himself because he, he himself he, knew the precautions he had made to make it impossible for underage wizards to do so. Therefore, that is the first thing Dumbledore would know. Well, and why would and honestly, why would Harry want to be yeah. in that tournament? Really, um, I mean, I know, and, and actually, I thought this was handled well. Where he's like, you know, I'm not interested in glory, and then of course, a lot of his, a lot of, um, you know, his schoolmates yeah. think that he is because that's what nobody they would believe him. But. Yeah, nobody believes him, but <laughs> Dumbledore would, I think. Dumb, yeah, and it's partly because Dumbledore is such a great mind reader. There's that. Um, yeah. This, now, does he actually? He doesn't have any form of telepathy, does he, or is he just? Or, or do you just mean that, yeah. that he has a good sense of intuition? Does he actually have? Does Dumbledore actually, have telepathy? Well, in the fifth book, we're introduced to the fact that spells to read minds and spells to shade your mind, cover your mind from other people's reading it exist. And uh, and we know he has command over memories. Yeah, By the and, way, I love that effect. Yeah, the whole pulling cool. your memories out of your head thing. And uh, Harry, once Harry has this done to him in training with Snape. Um, he does recognize a similarity with the way Dumbledore sometimes looks at him and seems to be x-raying him. Ah. Mm. We put two and two together. So, I mean, Dumbledore has no need to shake Harry by the shoulders. Dumbledore is yeah. not banging his head against the wall trying to figure out what it all means. And, uh... So that was just a bit of a misrepresentation. Yeah, that's a we... That's a we decided to have our own take on this character for this one, because we're different directors, and that kind of thing. That kind of a thing is offensive to me as a viewer because the characters are the people I love. The characters are the people I go to a story for, and the characters are what I take ownership in, rather than you know the mechanics of the plot. Or, and again, and, even if you don't know the source material, you've you've seen. You've seen the character long enough now in three movies yeah. to have a sense of who he is, or at least you ought to. That, uh, that's that's when I start to feel like something. When your character, away. maybe this is unfair, but 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 when when your previous actor um, unfortunately passed away, and you got a new actor, and between those two movies, yeah. he feels a whole lot more consistent yeah. than he does between three and four when it's the same guy. I I think that's a problem. Yeah, that's. That's and good, and good on them for, for making him not seem like an entirely different character going into three with with a brand new yes, director. I mean, that, they did very well. that that's impressive. But then you get into four and you're like, why is he acting like this? Yeah. So that we would hope does not continue to happen. But uh, do you have any other big points? I just as in the third movie, I felt the heavy leaning on modern day muggle street clothing kind of took me out of that world um, well, Bud the, punk the punk band rock band in the, in the dance that. yeah, really again took me out of the world and the fact that the lyrics of their songs when I had seen the movie enough times to, times to start kind of making them out um, kept were talking about hippogriffs and trolls and crazy elves it didn't help. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I agree with you. Uh, sorry. Because I just, well, I'm sorry. I just my thing is, their culture is different from from Muggle culture. And why is Muggle cult culture so um, um, w w in music? permeating yeah. their society when nothing else is, obviously. You've got... Re remember that yeah. in the second movie, I think it's the second movie, you've got you've got Weasley's... Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, you've got, you've got Mr. Weasley um, saying, uh, asking Harry, yeah. what is the function of a rubber duck? Yeah. These are different... Cult to the point where they don't have freaking rubber ducks? Yeah. Really? And we got a punk rock band? I don't buy it. Because, because, um, because music in... In, in, in America, well, in other cultures, too, I mean, other, other countries, um, because, okay, there's a lot of yeah. punk rock in Britain, but I'm just saying that, like, that like music... More so than here. More so than here, but, I mean, music in different countries, um, uh, popular music, you know, it's something that evolves and grows and happens um, such because of 
uh, uh, par- partially uh, because it's being sold to people the, 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 way, yeah. that, the way that it is, uh, because it's, it's a mass market kind of thing. I don't buy that in this culture. I'm yeah. making way too big of a deal out of this, aren't I? Um, I don't know. I just I, Probably, I don't, but... I don't like that. It's, it, it, I don't it, buy it. it. Takes me out. Once you take, once it takes something, takes you out of the world to get back. You start in. thinking about it, yeah. And it's hard to stop unless, of course, you're good at not thinking about anything. In which case, you're probably not watching us talk about this. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, you know, Mister Weasley collects plugs because he just thinks electricity is fascinating. He doesn't know how to pronounce it. Yeah, and nobody else cares uh, yeah. about that. How would they have punk rock music? And other things. Now, to be fair, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna cry foul on that, I, even though I liked this part in three, I have to also probably say where did uh, Lupin get uh, big band jazz? Unless he yeah, too so. is a collector of um, of uh, you know you know yeah. Muggle stuff, because at least that was a record. At least yeah. that wasn't like like. Like magic people making that yeah. kind of music, because I have a tough time with that. On the flip side, Lupin, being a werewolf, is not able to live within the magical community the way anyone else is. Then it's fine. So he really is kind of a margin dweller, and if anyone's going to be cross fertilizing, I like that it's a record and people. not like a MP3 player or a CD or something. I mean, yeah, so and then it's and then it's on a very old fashioned kind of phone, kind of them kind of phonograph. I love the phonograph and and the. Dance lesson scene with McGonagall, that is the great huge horn and the needle. That was a very nice touch. If they have to have record players in the Wizarding World, let them be like that. Yeah, and just as old fashioned as you can possibly make them. With just the touch of ridiculous. Just like shy the, of having a guy. Wouldn't it be really funny like if crazy Filch had a crank? That the band has in the, <laughs> the third task with yeah. the triple horned tubas and the. Stuff. Well, that's the kind of thing you would expect. I mean, it's maybe a little bit Dr. Seuss, but... A little. (laughs) But, you know, have that kind of not-your-normal-real-world aspect that, uh, you know, helps us remember we're in fantasy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you, I just, you totally looked like you had something else to say. Um, I was in fantasy for a while. Well, um, I kind of covered everything I wanted to, so um, unless you've got anything else on your list. I think we're set here. Uh, shout out to Patrick Doyle, uh, the composer of the score here. The, uh, John Williams is, a, I guess, finally retired. Absolutely. Uh, Fantastic score. Patrick Doyle done a lot of other score work, most notably recently in, in my radar anyway. He did the score for Brave with Pixar. Is also a fantastic score. Um, he's using some thematic material from the earlier films. He's pulling up some of the some of the character themes that uh, John Williams cre- gave left him. But and a that's lot of expected. Music is fresh. Yeah, yeah, yeah and I do. They're well integrated. Um, splendid work there. You start losing that that those those main Harry Potter themes um, as as the series gets darker because they just don't really fit yeah. the material at that point. Um, are there any and I guess we'll notice this as we go on are there any movies that just don't have the fanfare? Like even like 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 slightly inside of it at all. You know, you, you know that da, 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 da. like is there is there a movie that doesn't have that? Cuz I think I'm not sure. I think I remember Could reading or, or noticing that one of them didn't have it at all. But uh, and it might be 72 that doesn't have it, but Could be I don't remember. We'll have to find out. But I'm glad you mentioned that because because you're absolutely right. And um, I don't know if he scored all of the ones um, after Williams left. I'd have to check. But if he did, uh, his the the score for six is is is, is the best yeah. score out of all of them, in my opinion. Well, not all of them because you know Sean Williams did some great stuff, obviously. But of the darker have, ones, yeah. of the last four, I think he may have. But we'll look that up. Well, anyway, uh, thanks everybody once again for uh, watching our uh, latest installment on uh, Harry Potter discussions. And uh, next time, of course, we're going to be talking about Harry Potter and... The Order of the Phoenix. Indeed. And I can't wait, because I freaking love that one. Anyway, um, well, everybody, thanks again for watching. I'm Captain Logan. And I am the Jeff. We'll see you next time. (laughs) (laughs) He's got to do it every time.